about. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, the concept of witnesses that appears in this week's parsha. So in this week's parsha, you have the name of the parsha is Shoftim, which is judges. And the opening statement is that Shoftim v'shotrim titan l'cha b'chal sh'arecha, judges and police, you should place in all your gates. Gates means all your cities. In other words, there is a commandment to establish a justice system. Interesting that this, that's also, that commandment happens to be one of the seven, the commandments of the seven Noahide laws, the seven universal laws of Judaism that are for the entire world, um, because there has to be a moral, a moral um, authority that is able to um, adjudicate justice to the best, to the best, the best as possible, but um, it's in the Torah, it's written in this week's parsha for the Jewish people. And uh, you have many ideas about the legal system, but one of the things it talks about is the idea of witnesses and how, and how they have to be questioned and verified, et cetera, et cetera. So that, go, that gets us into the concept of witnesses in the Torah. And what we're going to look at a very, is a very interesting concept that within the Torah law, there's actually two categories of witnesses. And we're going to define the two categories and we're also going to show the halachic ramifications between these two categories. So it's not just theoretical, but it also has practical applications. And then once we deal with that, if we have extra time, we also go to the spiritual side of what does it mean to be witnesses because everything in the Torah is correct on multiple levels. And uh, we're going to think about our job as spiritual witnesses. And just a spoiler alert is that uh, Isaiah and the, and, the, and the prophet Isaiah says, I believe, I believe it's a prophet Isaiah who says um, that the God tells the Jewish people, Atem Eida, you are my witnesses in this world. So we testify about the existence of God, that our story, our existence, uh, the fact that we're still here as persecution is really a testimony to the presence of God. And uh, in light of that discussion and some of the ideas that we discussed in the legal part of the discussion about witnesses is also going to uh, influence our understanding of what our spiritual purpose as witnesses are. We'll see how far we get. Okay. Um, but we begin with the question of what is the purpose of witnesses? What's the purpose of testimony? Now, uh, conventional, conventional understanding is, well, um, the idea of a test of witnesses is because there may be a disagreement. So if there's a disagreement about what, what, what happened, or if there's two parties who disagree about uh, their transaction, so we're not sure what to do, so we find witnesses to help us clarify what, in fact, took place. And that's the conventional interpretation of witnesses. And that definition of witnesses does exist within the Torah, but we're going to say that's not the only definition. There are other definitions as well. Um, the first thing I'm going to try to do here is share the link um, chat, share the link to this English translation of the Rebbe's essay, and then I'm going to, yes, share the uh, share the screen. Okay, and we'll jump right in. We'll see how far we go. Whatever we don't finish this year, we can finish next year. No, we'll see. Okay. I'm uh, certainly not going to finish it today. I mean, say we're not going to conclude the whole point. Hopefully, I can give you the main parts. See. Okay, here we go. Concerning testimony in court about what scripture says, by the word of two witnesses, the case should be confirmed. That's this week's parsha. Quote from this week's parsha. Al Pishnaim Adim, based on the testimony, based on the mouth of two witnesses, the matter should be confirmed. So that so the Rebbe says we find two types. In other words, there are two categories of witnesses. The first is corroborating witnesses. Um, I'm not sure this is the best translation, clarifying witnesses. And that's the, con that's the conventional concept. Similar to witnesses for a loan, their purpose is to verify that a loan took place. But the loan itself is not contingent on having witnesses. Even if the loan had taken place without witnesses, the borrower is still obligated to pay his debts. Accordingly, by the word of two witnesses, the case should be confirmed means that the case should be ascertained through two witnesses. So let's say I borrow $50 from you. 
and we get two witnesses. Now, you don't really need the witnesses for me to be obligated to repay you. The obligation for me to repay you is because of the action, because of the transaction, not because of the witnesses. Why do we have witnesses? We have witnesses in case I deny it. Why would I deny it? Well, maybe I am uh, a bad person. In other words, maybe I'm morally, morally compromised. Or maybe I forgot. That's also a possibility. You don't have to say always oh, everybody's so terrible. But the bottom line is it's only here to clarify in the pace of a uh, in a case of a uh, confusion or a case of uncertainty. That's the conventional, that's the conventional idea of witnesses. And that's one category that we find within the Torah. Now we're gonna to go to the second category, which in some ways is more interesting. Um, where, where else do we find witnesses in Judaism? So here's what we call not corroborating witnesses, but we have ratifying witnesses, or in Hebrew, ede um, kiyu, witnesses that establish the matter. And this is similar to the witnesses for marriage, where testimony is integral to the marriage. The law is that even when a man and a woman admits to having gone through the marriage process, if there were no witnesses, the law is we disregard the betrothal, meaning that without witnesses, there is no marriage. But this kind of testimony, the case should be confirmed means that through them, the matter is finalized. So what do you need for a Jewish wedding? Some people think you need a rabbi, you don't. Some people think you need 10 people. Not really. You need 10 people to say the blessings, the, the blessings for the marriage. But what is the marriage? So the marriage really is all you need for a marriage is you need a, a bride, you need a groom, but you must have two witnesses. And think about these two witnesses that are at a wedding. Any Jewish wedding, any chuppah would have two witnesses. And they designate which two people will be the witnesses. And think about the, these witnesses. These witnesses are not here to... Um, in case the man or woman deny that they're married. That's not why they're there. Um, even if the man in the, the case we just spelled out, the man and woman both agree. They say, we, were, we, we, we the man gave the woman the ring and we followed the procedures and everything was fine and we have no disagreement and everything is fine. Um, the law is they're not legally married until there were two witnesses. So again, these witnesses are not corroborating the, 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 the story, they are they say ratifying or establishing, they are integral, they're making it happen. And based on this interpretation, so the thing is we have, two, we have one verse. The verse is by the mouth of two witnesses, the matter will stand. Yakum davar, the matter will stand. Um, but so what we're saying here, um, they're saying by the, by, by the word of these two witnesses, the case should be confirmed. That's, that, that's, that's the, the way they translate it. But it's literally, by the word of two witnesses, the case should stand. Yakum davar, the matter should stand. Now the question is, what does the matter should stand mean? So if we're talking about the first category of witnesses, the matter should stand would mean that um, the matter should be confirmed. Now we know, as, as ascertained, now we know that it's true. But the second interpretation is actually more literal. Um, the witnesses of a marriage, they're not just here to ascertain that, they, that the event happened, but they establish it. If there are no witnesses, there's no event. As opposed to the loan, which if I borrow fifty dollars from you, even if there is no witnesses, the, um, my moral obligation, I still have to pay you back. And the witnesses are only, uh, and the witnesses are only um, here in the case of denial. But the uh, but the legal um, responsibility exists independent of the witnesses. So that's two categories of witnesses. Interesting because it gives us. Um, it gives us, uh, you know, you know, de definitions and the, and the, and the, and the de definitions and the def definitions define how we think about the witnesses. And we'll see in a minute that it also defines. Uh, there are also halachic ramifications. There are also practical and legal ramifications. Whether you're only a corroborating witness or you are a ratifying witness, or in simple English, whether you are clarifying witnesses or you are establishing witnesses. And some of those cases some of those ramifications we're about to get into. Okay, just wanna make sure so far so good. Everybody's happy and comfortable with these definitions. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know that in American law or in law that's not religious law, you would have the concept of the second category, of ratifying witnesses, witnesses that make it happen. They are not just here to confirm, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it does exist, I would be happy to hear. Go ahead, Vicky. Oh, thank you, Rabbi. I, I just have a question about the uh, if there is a difference in the case because if there is a monetary issue, it's one um, yes, one yes, category. Yes. 
but if there is marriage, it's more like spiritual matter. So I guess it's a, if, if there is a difference. Yeah, there is a difference. In other words, in other words, you have to look at every category that requires witnesses. And the first question you ask yourself is what type of witnesses are required in this case? And if the witnesses are required is, is uh, ratifying witnesses, or sorry, category one is corroborating witnesses, or and I'll say it's simple, or clarifying witnesses, then, then we have one set of rules. And if it's like you mentioned, usually it's religious law or marriage law, more spiritual things, there you have ratifying with you there you need a witness to establish but you're right it's not it's nothing to do with our personal transaction it's not our personal preference it's what category of law it is and what that specific category of law requires that is correct thank you okay now we want we want to look at some of the ramifications between these two categories the first question we're going to ask um i don't know if it's the most important one but it's the first one not, 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 not asked. The first thing we're going to think about is um, when do you become a witness? Why that's important, we'll talk about that later. But when do you become a witness? So if you're in category number one, we'll read it inside in a minute, but I'm just going to try to give a synopsis here. If you're in category number one, that your main function as a witness is to function in the case of, uh, of uh, to function in the case of uh, this, uh, where, there's, where there's a dispute or where there's a denial. So where do you kick in? Where do you serve your function when you come to court testimony to, te to testify, to clarify what took place? So in other words, if I come to court today, and I would testify about something that happened last year, I really become a witness today. In other words, witness means testimony. When are you testifying? The fact that I saw it then is one thing, but, but I become a witness when I testify. We'll explain what that means and why that is. Whereas, if I witness a wedding last year, when do I become a witness? You don't need me to clarify in the case of a dispute. I'm, I serve that function as well. But I had to be a witness at the wedding. So when do I become a full-fledged witness at the moment of the transaction? So that's what we're going to try to say. We say if you're category number one, if you're a clarifying witness, then you become a witness when you clarify. If you're a car ca category number two, where you become a witness, um, you're an establishing witness. You're part of the process that creates this transaction, not a transaction, this legal entity of marriage. Then when do you become a witness? Not if you're going to testify about it 20 years later. You become a witness at the moment of that uh, of legal action. Now, that sounds theoretical, but you'll see in a minute that, that it too has ramifications. When you become a witness will define what you need to do to become a witness. So let's read it inside and we'll see what happens. Then you tell me if you agree, you disagree, you like it, you don't like it, all that is good. Okay. Based on the above distinction, it turns out there, there's another difference between corroborating witness and ratifying witnesses. In other words, we, we, before we gave, we gave the theoretical concept, now we're going to try to make it more practical. In regards to corroborating witnesses, category number one, uh, witnesses that corroborate, they clarify what happens. Since their function is to verify what happens, they become witnesses primarily at the time of verification, when they come to verify what happened by testifying in court. In other words, yeah, okay, let's finish the paragraph. However, with respect to ratifying witnesses, since their, since their function is to finalize the act of marriage, it follows that once they witness the act, the, the, the criterion for authoritative witnesses has been met. In other words, if you say at the marriage, you must have witnesses for the marriage, and the marriage is not complete unless there are witnesses there, then the witnesses at the marriage are become witnesses at the chuppah at the marriage even if they didn't testify, testify about it 20 years later. But in category number one, I, I, I saw the transaction. I saw that last year someone gave you $50. I saw it, but I'm not really a witness until I come and testify about it. Now, what, what, why is that so important? So here we're going to get to the first practical ramification. Practical ramification is that... Um, Based on, 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 the, on the verses in this week's parsha and other places, whenever the Torah mentions witnesses, the Torah says that the witnesses have to be interrogated. There's an obligation that if witnesses show up, you have to interrogate the witnesses 
to corroborate that they're saying the truth. That is, that is what the Torah says. So the idea here is as follows. It's based on a teaching from, uh, from Rabbi Yosef Rosen, Rosen, who was commonly known as the, the sage of Rogachev or the genius of Rogachev. He passed away in the 1930s. And the Rebbe was very was influenced by his by his way of studying. The Rebbe wrote, corresponded with him. The Rebbe was very young; he was very old. But the Rebbe often, sometimes said that he he really was influenced by um, the Rav Trevor's way of studying. So the Rav Trevor says like this: We know the law that if someone comes to testify, they have to, they have to be they have to be um, they have to be you have to corroborate them. You have to question them. You have to question the testimony. But there's one exception, or or a few exceptions. One exception is the law uh, witnesses who testify for a marriage. If I show up in court and I say, I'm the witness, I was at a wedding a year ago, I was the witness for the betrothal. The law is you don't have to question me. If you want to, you can, but you don't have to. I become a witness even without you questioning me. So the Rabbi Chavar says like this, how come? Why is that? Why is that the law? Why is it that all witnesses, the Torah says you have to, you have to question the witnesses? So why are you saying that singling out, for example, marriage, there are other cases, but single out, singling out marriage and, say, and saying that a witness for marriage does not have to be, does not have to be questioned. So what the Rabbi Trevor is going to say like this, when the Torah says you have to question the witness is if a person shows up and wants to become, a, so that's category number one. Category number one is witnesses who are here to clarify, clarify what happened, corroborate what happened. And what do we just say? When did become when when do they become a witness? They become a witness when they come to court to testify. So somebody come, wants to come to court to testify, they ha you have to corroborate what they're saying because that will determine whether or not they're a witness. But if the marriage witnesses, the second category, because they become witnesses, not when, they, when they're being questioned in court, they became witnesses at the wedding. So you don't have to question them. Why would you have to question them? You only question them to see if they're witnesses, but these people are witnesses already a year ago, not right now when they're coming to testify. So let me read it inside and we'll see if we understand. On this basis, the Raghav Chavar explains why witnesses at a marriage do not need to be examined or interrogated. Ex examination and interrogation are necessary for witnesses so deemed primarily by virtue of giving official testimony in court. In such cases, what they testify that they witnessed is not considered as testimony unless the court first examine and interrogates them. However, in regards to witnesses for a marriage and so forth, who function as ratifying witnesses, the Torah has already considered what they observed as being witnessed when the act of marriage took place, the court need not examine or interrogate them in order to make them witnesses because they have already become witnesses once they observe the acts. So this is the big idea. This is not the, this is one, 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 one practical idea, one practical ramification. I'm going to try to spell it out one more time, and then I would love to open the mic and see if people agree or, or if this resonates with you or not. Uh, what are we saying here? We're saying I come to court. I want to testify about something. There's no way to know if, if I'm a good witness or not. Nobody, who decided I'm a witness? The only way to know is to ask the questions and find out. And that's why the Torah says, if someone shows, shows up to court, you have to ask them questions to figure out if they're a witness, okay? That's all in the first category of testimony. But in the second category of testimony, this couple has been married for 20 years. The only way their marriage was valid is because I was the witness, not me, me and somebody else. Two of us were witnesses at their chuppah. So what are you going to tell me? You're going to tell me that we don't become a witness until we testify in court 20 years ago? That's impossible. That would invalidate their marriage. So obviously the Torah considers us witnesses because we were at the act of, of the marriage, because we're the second category of witnesses. We're ratifying witnesses. And therefore, when I come to court to testify about what happened 20 years ago, I don't have to be questioned. You could question me if you want to, but I don't have to be questioned to make me a witness because the Torah already made me a witness when I saw the act, because when I saw the act, that's when I must start functioning as a witness, as opposed to the first category, which is this corroborating witnesses. I saw that you loaned someone fifty dollars ten years ago. But does that make me a witness? I I saw I saw that it happened. But if I show up to court, they don't know that I'm a witness. There's only one way to find out by asking questions, and only once I'm verified do I become a witness. In other words, that I become a witness in court. 
Whereas if I testify about a wedding that happened 20 years ago, I became a witness 20 years ago at the wedding. And therefore, right now, when I show up to court to testify about it, they could or could, or they, 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 if they want, they could question me, but they don't have to because the, because the questioning is not integral to the becoming of the witness. That's one ramification, a little bit abstract. Then we have one more ramification before we get to the spiritual side of things. Questions, comments, jokes um, um, are, are welcome. Of course, this is the best, best, uh, best material for jokes because you can have what you have lawyer jokes or marriage jokes. They're both related to our topic. So lawyer jokes and marriage jokes. Um, yeah, there's a lot, to, a lot, a lot to say. I just don't remember any offense. Okay, one, 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 uh, one. So we have one ramification down. We'll do one more before we move to the spiritual. Okay, there is a law in all, all throughout Judaism, with very, very few exceptions. That's called Taich Kadei Dibor Kadibor, which basically means that while I'm speaking is still like I'm speaking. While I'm still speaking, it's considered like I'm speaking. What does that mean? It means that if, I'm, if I say something and I immediately retract, I, it's a retraction. So if I say, I'm gonna give you a million dollars, you know what, I won't. That's a, that's a legal retraction. Because while I'm still speaking, then what I clarify at the end is part of the same manner of speech. But if I say I'm going to give you a million dollars, well, a million is a bad example because I'm not going really to obligate it. It's an but let's not get it that. Ten dollars. Ten dollars works. If I come to you and I say, I'm going to give you ten dollars, that's a legal obligation. If I wait 15 seconds, really, it's like saying three. If I wait 10 seconds and I say, you know what? I changed my mind. It's too bad. You already made a statement. Time has elapsed. You cannot retract your statements. I would be obligated to give you ten dollars, even if even if uh, I don't owe you anything. But if I committed to give a gift, I have to give a gift. So that applies everywhere throughout the Torah, right? If I say something and I retract immediately, it's considered a retraction. One difference is marriage. If a man goes up to a woman, gives her a ring, and says, uh, "I hereby betroth you according to the laws of Moses and Israel." And he says, you know what? I'm joking. Keep the ring for the fun. Keep the ring as a gift. I don't want to be married to you. Right? So what happens? So I would expect, like all matters of the Torah, you could retract while you're still talking. But the law is no. The law is you cannot retract. Too bad. Marriage. You're married. You don't like it. Get divorced. But you're married. And the question is, why? Why? Like, who decided that? Like, we, well, like, what's the reason for that? What is the philosophical reason for that? Now, we know that's the law. The Talmud says so. That's the law both by wedding and by divorce, by the way. So by divorce would be the same thing. If a person, if a man, if a man tells a woman, I'm giving you the document of the old divorce and here you're, by, you're hereby divorced. Oh no, I was joking, okay? So in all matters of law, a retraction would work because it's still within, within the same statement. There was, no, uh, there was no time elapsed between the statement and the retraction. Whereas in marriage and, 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 and divorce, the law is you cannot um, retract once the statement was made. Why is that? Based on the based on the two categories that witnesses will understand this, and the idea is like this. Um, usually, what we say is like this. Usually, we say that yes, the law, the rule is that a person could clarify what he meant while he's still talking. So while you're still talking, you could still change it and ratify it and 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 uh, and and qualify it and and nullify it. No problem. Okay. The problem is with marriage and divorces like this. It's not in my hands. Because there are witnesses here, and the witnesses see something, if they establish the matter, they ratify the matter, they confirm the matter. So the moment I said it, and the witnesses observed it, it's no longer in my hands. It's no longer I can now ratify it and, and change it and clarify. It's already said, it's all, the matter has already been established because the witnesses have made it happen. Whereas in all other matters of law, most matters of law, where the witnesses do not establish the matter. They don't ratify the matter. They're just here to clarify in case of a dispute. Then the law is it's up to me. While I'm still talking, I could, I could, I could explain what, I'm, what, I, what, what I meant. But, once, because, but when it comes to matters where you need witnesses, not just to, clar not to clarify, but to establish and to ratify the matter, 
Once I say you are betrothed to me, the witnesses have seen it, gone, it's done, it's a done deal. Now, because it's out of my hands, I cannot retract. It's too late because it has already been established. So I'm not going to read the whole thing inside. I'm going to try to read just that one sentence, that one paragraph, and then we'll try to get to the spiritual side. I'm going, to start, I'm going to read two paragraphs, so it is true. On page, uh, second page, sec, second, second paragraph of page five. Okay. Okay, we're going to skip the first paragraph. We'll to the last one. With respect to marriage and divorce, the act of marriage is finalized by means of being witnessed. Therefore, as soon as this takes place, as soon as this takes place, it is no longer in the power of the man who is initiating the marriage or divorce to cancel the action, since it is the witnessing that formalizes the marriage. In all other cases, however, with the witnessing is not uh, with the witness with the witnessing is not what creates the reality, and what is accomplished is accomplished by the person alone. In such a case, one may renege if done in a short order. Okay, so what it, this helps clarify a little bit. If I come up to you and I say, I am giving you $10, who creates that obligation? It's all in my hands. I'm creating that obligation. Therefore, if, if, if it's within no time elapsed, I could clarify and I could, I could clarify and I could renege and I could qualify. And I could say, oh, no, I was just joking because it's all in my hands because who creates the obligation? Me. It's all in my hands. So if I created it, then, well, then if no time passed, it's all considered one statement. The problem with marriage, not the problem, the marriage, it's not that the man is creating it. Even the man and woman together with their both, with their, both agree, their, their agreement is not creating this marriage. They're important, obviously, but they're not creating it. What creates it is the fact that this has been testified to and witnessed by two witnesses. Oh, so the moment that those witnesses did their part by observing what happened, it's no longer in the hands of the man. And therefore, he can't say, oh, you know what? Let me, let me qualify. It's too late. It already happened. It's not in your hand to pull it back once it's out of your hand. And it has to go out of your hand because the witnesses are key here. The witnesses are what make, what make it happen. Whereas in the case of where I come and I say that I'm going to give you $10, even if witnesses are watching, the obligation has nothing to do with the witnesses. Witnesses are just here in case I deny it. But the obligation happens because I said so. So it's all in my hands. If it's all in my hands, I could retract. So what do we have so far? We have two classifications of what witnesses are. One witness is here just to testify. I'm sorry, just clarify in case of disputes. Another witness is here, even if there's no dispute. Man and woman came and said he gave me a ring and I, and I accepted it and I, betrothed, and, and I was betrothed. Everything is fine. They say, who are the witnesses? Oh, we didn't have witnesses. There's no dispute. It's not a marriage because in those in that case you need the witnesses to actually uh, establish the matter. So that was the, that was the that was the big idea. Now, what are the ramifications? Well, the first ram the first definition, not a ramification yet, but the first thing is when do you become a witness? Category one: the clarifying witnesses become a witness when they clarify, and that leads to the first ramification. The first ramification is. When they come into court to clarify, you have to you have to question them because who said it, who said they're witnesses? We don't know if they're witnesses. Maybe they are. Maybe they aren't. Category number two, they become witnesses at the moment of the transaction of the legal event, at the moment of the marriage, and therefore, if they come twenty years later to to to, to, to testify about it, you don't have to question them because they are already witnesses. What made them witnesses if they haven't yet testified in courts? They're not witnesses because by testifying in court, testifying in court for them is just a technicality. They're witnesses because they observe the matter and they made it happen legally. They, 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 they created the legal entity of marriage by their observing. So now when they come 20 years later, you, want to, you don't have to question them to make them witnesses. They are already witnesses. If you don't agree to that, you just invalidate the marriage and, and retroactively for the past 20 years. So that's the first ramification. Second ramification is 
um, whether a person could retract. In all matters of commitment, the person could renege within while he's still talking. If you're still talking, you could pull back. It's in your hand. You created the obligation. You could, you could ratify it. You could change it. You can establish it. You could renege. You could qualify it. But if there are, if this is a matter that requires testify, uh, um, a witnesses who, who ratify, or witnesses who establish, then this is a matter that it's out of my hands. It has been witnessed. People have seen man giving the woman the ring and saying, you're betrothed to me according to the laws of, of, of Moses and Israel. Done deal. I can now talk for the next 10 minutes and try to renege. It's too bad because the action has already taken place. Why isn't it still in my hands? Because you're not, you're, not, you're not the only one who's making it happen. Like any other legal transaction, here, what's making it happen is the testimony of the witnesses. And this, ladies and gentlemen, concludes the legal analysis of this essay. Now we're going to try to go to the spiritual analysis. If we had time, we could really uh, um, explain, show how every detail that applies in the legal also applies in the spiritual. But I don't know if we have that much time here. But let's, let's take a minute or two to... Um, Think about this. Okay, the essay goes very, very detailed from number seven to the end, to, which is 14. So the second half is, is, is very detailed. I'm not going to go to the part that's too detailed. I'm going to read. It's a full concept. Hopefully, we can read the, entire, the entirety of... Um, Hopefully we can read the entirety of section five. Section five is a full idea and it's beautiful and you can go home with it. And um, yeah, I think that's enough. I think I, I think I think if we go if we do till five, if we read the whole, whole five, then um, then we'll be good. We'll read four two four four is also short. We'll read four and five. That's the goal. Robert, can I ask you a good question? Yes. What if there is no witnesses? It's hard to imagine that during marriage, I mean, uh, somebody would say that and just uh, absolutely right away. I mean, you were asking for marriage joke. Here it is. <laughs> that somebody just says, I am marrying you. No, I, I'm just kidding. So even without the witnesses, it's not a joking matter. But, but, but Vicky, in our mind, a wedding means you plan a wedding hall and you get the pictures. And you get and you and the, and the groom and, and the groom gets a tuxedo and the bride gets a white gown. That's not a wedding. A wedding is a man gives a woman something that's worth a pruta, a coin, and he says, "You are betrothed to me." And that's she's married. In the olden days, they actually had the marriage, the, the completion of the marriage ceremony, twelve months later. It's like Eliezer and and, and Isaac. Eliezer gave Rebecca the the ring, and she, that was that could have been betrothal. Right, so you can give someone a, a glass of wine and say, "Oh, you're married to me." Oh no, I was joking. It's just a gift. Now, of course, she has to accept it. It's not unilaterally in the, in the hands of the male, right? She has to agree. But the point here is, you, you, for, for the legal marriage or divorce, you don't need a photographer. You don't need a wedding planner. So, so yes, there could be a fine line between somebody uh, trying to be close to somebody and trying to show friendship and trying to show, "I want to gift you with something," but they don't want to take it. So I say, "Oh, you know what? This will be the betrothal." Okay, no, we were just kidding. Too bad, right? So, so, so that, so, so that, that's. I think it's. I think that. I think that in the from the perspective of the Torah, it's a lot more likely to somebody make a joke about this, right? There was a, there's a legal case. There's a legal case where 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 two cousins were playing, and they were 13. They made a mock wedding. Then it came to the rabbis. Is the mock wedding? Maybe they need a divorce. Maybe this is. Maybe the mock wedding was really real. If the witnesses were there and they said it. Well, they made it and ended as a joke, so that's the question. But 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 this it does. You don't need to hire a hall to make something to make something uh, to make something a wedding, right? You don't need the photographer. Right, right. But but the moment that the wedding is actually uh, legalized is where you give the ring. You give something. Give the ring. But you don't or, have to you could, or, you could, or, yeah. there is another moment where if, even if you don't have a ring, if you want the men and women are alone, is it another so that, one? So that, that's another way. There are three ways. But let's stay with the money. It doesn't have to be money. It could be. It doesn't have to be a ring. It could be anything of value. So I can give somebody a glass of wine on a date and say as a joke, oh, you know what? Let's, let's be betrothed. To, boom, done. If there are two witnesses that are kosher, kosher means that they, let's say, for example, they're not related. People who are related can't be witnesses. 
right? So, so boom, you're in trouble. In other words, then you have then you got to figure out was this a betrothal? So it's not so I, I you know okay I say I say here for a joke you know okay you let's be married okay so uh, no I was kidding so so the, again the point of not the point is not to figure out how likely is this case we're always by definition going to think about the strange cases the cases at the borders to define what is happening and and when is it happening and here it's very important when it happens determines what is happening. Right. If, if my first function as a witness is to testify twenty years later, then I know that I'm a clarifying witness. If I'm, I, if if what makes me a witness is the fact that I've seen it, and really I don't even have to testify about it, just the fact that I was there is key. And I'm I'm needed even if there was no denial. Then I'm then I'm a ratifying then, then I'm a ratifying witness. I'm an establishing witness. It's a whole different category. Okay, so I'm going to read. I'm going to read a little bit of a little bit of four and a little bit and, and and hopefully the whole five. I'm a little pressed of time, but we'll see how far we can get this. Okay, let's go to four. All matters in the revealed aspect of the Torah fit with the way they are found on a, on a deeper level. This is a very fundamental Hasidic concept. Every law in the Torah has a spirit reflect a spiritual truth. So we're going to discuss this. They were saying with several ideas that were discussed here. I'm going to skip this because this is the second half of the essay. The verse says, you are my witnesses, says Hashem. Verse 14, Yeshayahu. Yeah, Isaiah 43. You are my witnesses, says Hashem. Who's, who is Isaiah talking to? Who's God talking to? In the Zohar, there are two interpretations. A, the witnesses are Israel, and B, the witnesses are the heavens and the earth. As it says in Deuteronomy, this day I call the heavens of the earth to be a witness against you. So in other words, there's two possibilities. When, the, when God says God has witnesses in this world, there are, two, there are two things that testify about God. Number one is the Jewish people. We, we, we brought the idea of monotheism to the world. But number two, heaven and earth. The fact that there's heaven and earth testify to the existence of God because the creation tells us that there's a creator. But now we're going to get, now we're going to jump into the, to connect it to what we said before. We can say that the two types of witnesses, Israel and the heavens and the earth, correspond to the two categories of witnesses, corroborating witnesses and ratifying witnesses, as will be explained. Heaven and earth is category number one. Heaven and earth testify about if, in case of dispute. The Jewish people are ratifying witnesses. They make it happen. And now we're going to explain what does this mean. So now we're going to get into a little Hasidic. The idea, the idea, the concept that we testify about the presence of God is nice. We're going to get into, into more detail. And what we're going to say, we're going to say that from the perspective of from the perspective of Judaism, okay, let's, let's do slow. Let's read it inside. The Alter Rebbe explains at length that the testimony of witnesses only applies to something that is hidden and is concealed from the eyes of all. But for something revealed, there is no need for witnesses. And any testimony is irrelevant. So this is a principle, this, this is a, a legal concept. The legal concept is that testimony is required for something that is, that is hidden, that nobody knows about. If, if it's obvious, you don't need witnesses. And there's very interesting halakhic ramifications for that. Is, and for example, the law is that if a, for, if a woman comes and says her husband died, you believe her. One of the reasons you believe her without witnesses, even though typically divorce, you'll always need witnesses, is one of the reasons is because the husband, if he's alive, he may show up. So the question, if I ask you, did I borrow money from you 50 years ago? Nobody knows for sure. But if somebody alive or dead, if he's alive, he will show up. That's clear. You don't need witnesses for that. Right? So that's one halakha ramification, but there are more. Furthermore, even for something that is presently not revealed, but is something which is likely to be revealed, we also don't need complete testimony. Testimony of witnesses is needed specifically for something completely concealed. That's, so we have two categories. We have one category of something everybody knows. You don't need witnesses. Another category. There are some things that people don't know about, but, in, but it's likely to be revealed. That's the example I gave. Person comes and says the man died. A woman comes and says, one, wit one, one witness comes and says uh, a person died. Could his wife remarry? In this matter, the Torah says you have to have two witnesses. This matter, we say, no, one witness is enough. How come? Because you don't really need witnesses. Why don't you need witnesses? Because even though right now it's concealed, we're not sure whether or not this person died. But it's something that if he's alive, it's likely to, we'll, we'll, we will likely find out about. It. What do you need true witnesses for? Something that is completely concealed. What does this mystically mean? So I'm going to give it in short. In short, what it means is like this. 
The fact that God created the world is you don't need witnesses. That's logic. In other words, there's a creation, there's a creator. That's logic. You don't need witnesses. What you do need witnesses to testify is that God that creates the God, God, God is infinite. God transcends creation. Well, even the fact that God transcends creation, it's it also logic could lead you to there. So we're going to classify that not as something that is revealed, not as something that is need witnesses, not as something that is revealed, but something that is likely to be revealed. Because once you understand that a creation requires creator, then you understand that the creators must be create greater than the creation. So the God will so God will transcend creation. Witnesses is here to testify deeper truth. Deeper truth is the essence of God. The essence of God is not expressed in creation. That's the, that's, the mystic, that's the mystical concept of what it means to testify. Testify means you are expressing the essence of God. Um, I wish I had more time. We're going to go to the end for a second. Such testimony, in other words, testimony that's, that, that testify about the essence of God, is given by two types of witnesses mentioned above. If you're looking inside, it's page... Um, it's page seven. Cor corroborating witnesses is witnesses, namely heaven and earth, are fixed within creation and point to and reveal the power of the infinite which exists within creation. As known, the timelessness of heaven, whereby each celestial body individually continues to exist, and earth, whereby each species continues to exist, is enabled only through the power of the infinite. Therefore, heaven and earth are corroborating witnesses to Hashem's essence. So we didn't have time to discuss it at length. But what we're saying is like this. You look at the world. You look at creation. You see not only creator, but you see infinity. And because you see infinity, infinity is testimony to the essence of God because true infinity is related to the essence of God. Where do you see infinity in the world? So there's no true infinity. But you see things that are timeless. Nothing is timeless, right? But within creation... The fact that there's laws of nature and they continue and they continue on a timeless basis. So relative, relatively, when you consider relatively, you know, within the realm of creation, they're forever. That is an expression of infinity. Infinity comes from the essence of God. Now, where do you see timelessness in creation? So first of all, you have the, the, the Talmud says, you have the, you, the Medrash talks about this. You have the celestial bodies, the sun, the moon. These things go on forever. Again, nothing is forever, but within the realm of creation, it's forever. And even within species on earth, where the species itself, the individual species does not last forever, but the fact that the this, this, this species has the power to procreate, and that theoretically can go on forever, the generations can continue forever, that is a sign of infinity, and that's a testimony to the essence of God. So if I look at creation, I know there's a creator. I know there's a creator that transcends creation. I don't need testimony for that. But if I look deeply, I will see that there are certain expressions of infinity in the world. And the, that is the world testifying to me, not only that God exists, not only that God creates, not only that God transcends the world, but that God is infinite. That's point number one. Then we get to ratifying witnesses. This is the Jewish people. Ratifying witness. There are also witnesses that have been given the power to, so to speak, elicit Hashem's essence into the world. Like the ratifying witnesses which effectuate the acts. These are the souls of Israel that are rooted in Hashem's essence. Therefore, Jews have the power through the Avodah, the, the, the service of Torah and Mitzvot, to elicit the revelation of Hashem's essence in the world. This is a beautiful concept. What are we saying here? We're saying here is that the witnesses at the wedding, they look passive, but they're not passive. They are making this transaction happen. They are making this legal entity happen. And without them, it wouldn't happen. So the same thing is with the witnesses. Heaven and earth, they're not creating anything. They're just testifying to the fact that within this world, there are certain expressions of infinity which testify to the essence of God. But the Jewish people are not witnesses that test that, that clarify to something that all, already exists. The Jewish people, they create something. What does it mean they create with their testimony? When we testify about the existence of, God, of the essence of God, we are eliciting, we're bringing the essence of God into creation. How do we do that? When we do God's will, we study Torah, do the mitzvot. We're not just testifying about something that's objectively happening without us, but we're part of the process that's creating this. We're part of the process that make, that's making this happen. So heaven and earth, they're just telling a story, but we are writing the story. 
When we study Torah and do mitzvot, we're bringing the essence of God. We're revealing the essence of God within the creation. We're not the spectators. We are the players. And that's the difference in the first category of witnesses, where they're just saying, I saw that Yankel gave Shmerel $50. Am I involved? No, I'm just a spectator. The wedding, the witnesses of the wedding are actually critical because they make it happen. Without them, it wouldn't happen. So with God, God is infinite. Of course, God is God exists without our testimony, but he wouldn't be present in our consciousness. He wouldn't be present in this world. The essence of God would not, unless we do something to reveal his presence. And when we do, we're not just corrobor we're not just corroborating witnesses, we're not just witnesses clarified to something that already exists but we intensify the presence of the essence of God into creation. There's a lot more to say. We're about 50% done of the essay. And from here it goes, woo, they're totally abstract. So I'm glad that it's 1050. Uh, but I think this itself is, uh, this itself, I'm not hiding anything. You have the link, you could read it all day, all day and all night. Um, but this itself is, I think, a beautiful idea. Go ahead, Vicky. Oh, thank you, Rabbi. It, it is a beautiful, beautiful concept. And it's what, what's fascinating. It corresponds to the idea in physics about, about observer, because reality doesn't exist without observer. So we're just wondering when the essay was written yeah. and yeah. If, 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 if the rabbi knew about those, because it's so like, I mean, that's, that's um, rabbi's uh, original thought, right? Idea, no, the, 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 I think the first person who said it was a rugged shaver in the 1930s. Okay. Yeah. I imagine that then people were already talking about this, but it right. wasn't, it wasn't coming out. Einstein didn't like the whole idea that the observer makes the difference. I think, I think he did. Right, right, right. But the idea was already on the system. The idea was, was idea, but it wasn't, it was not, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody. It wasn't ratified. It wasn't ratified. <laughs> it was not, it was, it was, it was considered, if I understand correctly, it was mocked, it was mocked. Right. That was the whole idea of, I think the Schrodinger cat is making fun of that concept that, that something that the observer actually makes a difference. I think, I think maybe I'm wrong, but the idea here is that, but the concept already, I think was already floating around. And Raghu Trevor says, now mystically speaking, yes, when I, when I, when I'm, when, when, a, when, a, when a witness is doing something from the Torah's perspective and the Torah, remember Torah is 3000 years old, 4,000 years old, the Torah precedes creation, right? So from the truth of the Torah, yes, you could be an observer an observer is not just uh, innocent passive, but the observer influences reality. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. It's ratifying, but but the essay is actually much more beautiful than the cat theory. <laughs> <laughs> now the cat theory shows that 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 if you go by logic alone, you're not gonna you're not going to reach that conclusion. But I think re, I think the conventional science, the, the conventional understanding of of, of physics today is that the observer does make a difference. And before it's observed, it's not, it, the, you know, the particle could be in two places at once, right? So the point here is that, uh, yes, science tells you that our observations clearly do make a difference. And that's in line with what the Torah says, that you, the fact that two people saw the wedding, kosher witnesses saw the wedding, that makes them married. And if not, they would not be married. Now, before you knew this, before, before science tells you that the observer makes a difference, you'd say, it's totally arbitrary. Who decided? Why did the rabbis decide that? Where do they get the idea that, that a passive witness could make a spiritual entity take place? Oh, well, this, this, everything in science, it's not that the Torah, Torah knows science. Everything in science, everything in the world is a reflection of Torah, right? Because the, 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 the Medrash says, God looked in the Torah, and created the world. So the blueprint is the world. So because this concept exists in the Torah, it exists in the world as well. Okay, there you have it. That was good, thank you. Okay, wonderful day, everybody. There's a lot more to say, but uh, good to good to get back after a break. And I guess we get back as so we're starting the new, I guess, I guess it's almost a new year, right? We're getting in Elo, we're getting ready for Rosh Hashanah. So the point here is when we view ourselves and we view our role in the world, we're not just passive people uh, enjoying the show, coming to the to the baseball game just to observe. Like when we were, you know, the, the guy said, "You can life, you cannot. You can life divides between the between the spectators and the players." And make sure you're a player, right? Make sure you're accomplishing. So, from the Torah's perspective, every time we study Torah and we do a mitzvah, we're not just testifying to the truth of God, but we're actually making God's presence and affecting God's presence and bringing His essence into this world. So that is, in short, what we're supposed to be doing. And uh, let's keep it up. Wonderful. Wonderful day, everybody.